Hi, it's Paul Tilly. Welcome to HN 2100. Today, we're looking at Unit 3, which is the Collective Agreement Administration, Part 1. What we're going to be doing in this unit is looking at the actual administration of collective agreements. How do a collective agreement run from the time it is verified and ratified by the membership to the point it ends? Let's begin. After completing this unit, you should be able to discuss the role of arbitration in avoiding industrial conflict, describe forms of industrial conflict, outline the components of a strike, outline the components of a locker, establish essential elements for primary and secondary picketing, and define all kinds. Okay, so we're here we are, we're out now, we've got a collective agreement. There's going to be some trouble during the collective agreement. I think most collective agreements will have some hiccups as we move through. There will be disputes over interpretation of the wording, interpretation of the meaning, interpretation of one side's role versus another side's role. And this leads to problems. Now, the question is, if we recognize the problems, how do we solve them? Well, one alternative is to go on strike and shut everything down. Well, the regulations forbid us from doing that. We can't do that. So we have to have some dispute resolution method built into all contracts. In this section, we're looking at what are some of the dispute mechanisms that we can put in contracts, or that are put in contracts, mandated in contracts, that we can use in order to resolve these problems. First, I'm going to look at this concept of arbitration. Now, arbitration is a form of dispute resolution by an independent third party. In using arbitration, unions and management hand over their power to decide the dispute to the arbitrator. Now, you can imagine that that's a very reluctant move by either the management or the union because it gives the power to solve the problem to somebody else. It's not used that often, but it is an important hammer and an important tool in the alternative dispute resolution process. There is, in all collective agreements, according to the legislation, something called a first contract arbitration. Once we become certified in terms of the representative union for uh, a body of workers, we will go and approach the management and say, we want to begin negotiations. Management are supposed to meet with us and work in good faith to resolve the dispute. But with first contracts, it's the first time they've come out, the first time they've dealt with the union, the first time we've met, the first time we've got at this. Because of all the first times, there's a good chance that we're going to have some problems or things are going to break down. So what government has done is they've created a piece of legislation called first contract arbitration. And it acts as much of a ha as a hammer as it does a tool to resolve disputes. What first contract administration does is it says that first collective agreement, it's the very first one, in the event that we run into a conflict that we cannot resolve ourselves within the negotiations, then we have the right to provide, to bring that dispute to an arbitrator. And in fact, if we don't resolve it, the government will impose an arbitrator on us. That arbitrator then we'll resolve that unsolved dispute. The Labor Relations Board handles this. The arbitrator comes in, listens to both sides, writes a, a report or a findings, and that then is what is imposed as the contract. So the arbitrator will make the decision for us if we don't make it ourselves. Again, very few organizations are going to want that to happen. From the union side and the management side, neither one will want it to happen. So what this piece of first contract arbitration legislation does is it forces new unions and new employers, first time to the bargaining table, to actually work towards resolving their dispute quickly and effectively. But we're not limited to that in terms of conflict that arises at work and during contracts. Let's assume that we are into a position where we've worked very hard to find a resolution to our negotiations. We can't. We just can't seem to agree. What are some of the options that face us? Well, 
Let's take a look at strikes, lockouts, picketing, and boycotts as tools that are at the power of unions and at the power of management to use to force the other side's hands. First, we look at a strike. A strike is defined as a cessation of work or refusal of work or to continue to work by employees in combination or in concert or in accordance with a common understanding or alternatively a slowdown work or other conduct a consorted activity on the part of the employers in relation to work that is designed to restrict or limit input. In other words, we're slowing down the production. The strike actually stops it, but uh, any form of restriction on, on productivity. And the idea is to put pressure on management. <clears throat> the intended purpose is to compel the employer to agree to the terms and conditions of employment. The strike is most obviously a widely, widely practiced form of economic sanction used in industrial relations. The strike is a very powerful tool. It is a powerful tool and it is very common relative to other tools. Not very common in terms of actually occurring. While most labor negotiations can or some without work established, about 95% are resolved without any problems. Strikes usually generate a great deal of media attention, quite often highlighting the worst of the parties involved. So a strike doesn't make us look good. Neither side looks good at a strike. Again, another reason to get your resolves long before you ever get to a strike. All labor legislation in Canada require that there are no strikes or lockouts during the term of the collective agreement and usually requires that this be stated in the collective agreement. So a strike is a, a least, uh, least, the least desired option because it makes us look bad. Now, employers have an equivalent to a strike. It's called a lockout. What a lockout is, it occurs when the employer prohibits bargaining unit employees from entering the company premises as a means to put pressure on the union to agree to the terms and conditions being offered by management. So it's sort of like a reverse strike. Now, the same terms and conditions that apply to strikes apply to, to lockouts. You just can't lock people out for no reason at all. And you can't lock them out at any time. During the term of the agreement, you can't lock our workers. But there is a time when you can do it during negotiations. Lockouts are less common than strikes, and usually the union that is looking for improvements, and most employers are satisfied with the status quo. So not that common. In addition to strikes, we also have another form called a picket line. Now a picket line is used during strikes, but it can be used before a strike as well. When workers go on strike, they want to limit the production capabilities of the company in order to force the employer back to the bargaining table with an offer that's more acceptable to the union. The bargaining unit members often picket the employer, and picketers stand at the business entrance and exits, usually carrying signs, publicizing the issue in dispute, and discouraging people from entering and leaving the premises. It's a very political tool. It makes the strike visible. Picketers standing, refusing people through or delaying people through is a very visible tool that is used in order to get the union's point across. Again, very political tool. A boycott is another form. It, it's less common again, but what a boycott effectively does, it's an economic weapon in which the union appeals to the general public. Again, very political. It goes out to the general public as members of employers, customers, not to patronize business involved in the labor dispute by way of advertising pamphlets, leaflets, and even videos. This type of action can harm the employer if enough people support the boycott. So don't buy product A. The moment you say that, that means that less product A is sold and the employer will hurt because of that. The problem with it is a serious long-term consequence. You can't tell me don't buy product A today and then resolve the strike tomorrow and then, oh yeah, go ahead and buy product A. It causes confusion in people. So companies and unions are very reluctant to go boycott route. The boycott route, again, makes everyone look bad. Those are key things in that unit. If you have any questions, you make sure you let me know.